Welcome back to San Francisco. The Cube is live. Our day two coverage of VMware Explore 2022 continues. Lisa Martin with Dave Nicholson. Dave and I are pleased to welcome Jason Collier, Principal Member of Technical Staff at AMD to the program. Jason, it's great to have you. Thank you, it's great to be here. So what's going on at AMD? I hear you have some juicy stuff to talk about. Oh, we've got a ton of juicy stuff to talk about. <laughs> the, uh, um, you know, clearly the Project Monitor announcement was big for us, right? So we've got that to talk about. Another thing that, that I really wanted to talk about was a, was a tool that we created, and we call it, it's the uh, VMware Architecture Migration Tool. Uh, call it VAMT for short. Um, it's a tool that we created and we, we, we worked together uh, with VMware and some of their professional services crew to actually develop this tool. Um, and it is also an open source based tool. And really the primary purpose is uh, to easily enable you to move from one uh, uh, CPU architecture to another CPU architecture and, and do that in a cold migration fashion. So, we're, so you're probably not talking about uh, CPUs from Tandy uh, Radio Shack uh, systems. Likely, likely this is this would be what we might refer to as other x86 systems. Other x86 systems is a good way to refer to it. So it's an, it's interesting timing for the development and the you know the the release of a tool like this, because in this sort of x86 universe there are players who have who have been kind of delayed in terms of delivering their next gen stuff. My understanding is AMD has been public with the idea that they're on track for by the end of the year um, uh, Genoa. Yes. Right, next, yes. next gen architecture. Yep. So can you imagine a situation where someone has an existing set of infrastructure and they're like, hey, you know what? I want to get on board the AMD train. Is this something they can use? From the VMware environment, absolutely. And when you think, tell about, us exactly what that would look yeah. like. Walk us, walk okay. us through. Uh, you, know, hundred servers, VMware, thousand VMs. Just make make the math easy. Right. What do you do? How's it work? So, one, there there's several things that the tool can do. We actually went through the design process was quite extensive on this, and we went through all of the planning phases that you need to go through to do these VM migrations. Now, this has to be a cold migration. It's not it's not a live migration. You can't do that between the CPU architectures. But what we do is you create a list of all of the virtual machines that you want to migrate, right? So we, so we take this CSV file, we import this CSV file, and we ask for things like, okay, what's the name? Where do you want to migrate it to? So what from one cluster to another do you want to migrate it to? Uh, what are the networks that you want to uh, move it to? And then uh, the storage platform. So we can move uh, storage, it could either be shared storage or we could move say from like vSAN to vSAN, um, however you want to set it up, right? So it will do those storage uh, migrations as well. And then what happens is it's actually going to go through, it's going to shut down the VM, it's going to take a snapshot, it is going to then basically move the compute and or storage resources over. And once it does that, um, it's going to power them back up and it's going to check. It's going to, we've got some validation tools where it's going to make sure VM tools comes back up where everything is copesthetic, right? It didn't blue screen or anything like that. And once it comes back up, um, then you know, everything's good, it moves on to the next one. Now, a couple of things that we've got feature-wise we built into it, you can parallelize these tasks. So you can say, how many of these machines do you want to do at any given time? So it could be, you know, say 10 machines, 50 machines, 100 machines at a time that you want to go through and do this move. Now, if it did blue screen, it will actually roll it back to that snapshot on the origin cluster okay. so, so that there is some protection on that. A couple other things that are actually in there are, are things like uh, audit tracking. So we do full audit logging on this stuff. We take a snapshot. There's basically kind of an audit trail of what happens. There's also full logging, syslogging, and then also we'll do like email reporting. So you can say, you know, run this and then shoot me a report when this is over. Now one other cool thing is you can also actually define a change window. So I don't want to do this, you know, in the middle of the afternoon on a Tuesday, right? So I want to do this, uh, you know, kind of later at night uh, on over the weekend. You can actually just queue this up, set it, schedule it. Uh, it'll run. You can also define how long you want that change window to be. And uh, what it'll do, it'll, it'll do as many as it can. Then it'll effectively stop, finish up, uh, clean up the tasks, and then send you a report on what all was successfully moved. Okay, I want to go down the rabbit hole a little bit on this. Because right. I, I, I think it's important. Um, and if I say something incorrect, you correct me. No right? problem. In terms of my technical I gotcha. understanding. I got gotcha. So, you've got a VM. 
Essentially, a virtual machine typically will consist of an entire operating system within that virtual machine. Yep. So there's a construct that containerizes, if you will, mm -hmm. um, the operating system. Where, what, what is the difference? Where, where is the difference in the instruction set? Where does it lie? Is it in the OS's interaction with the CPU? Or is it, or is it between the construct that is the sort of wrapper around the VM that is the difference? Yeah, it's really primarily the OS, okay. right? And this is, uh, you know, we've not really had, uh, you know, too many issues doing this. And most, most of the time what is going to happen, that OS is going to boot up, it's going to recognize the architecture that it's on, it's going to see the underlying architecture and, and boot up. Um, all the major operating systems that we test, you know, work fine. I mean, you know, typically they're going to work on, you know, all the x86 uh, platforms, but there might be instruction sets um, that are uh, kind of enabled in one architecture that may not be in another architecture. And but you're usually, looking for that during this process. Well, usually the OS itself is going to kind of detect that. So okay. if it pops up, the, the one thing that, you know, is, that is kind of a caution that you need to look for, if you've got an application that's explicitly using an instruction set that's on one CPU vendor and not the other CPU vendor, that's the one thing where you're probably going to see some application differences. That said, it'll probably be compatible, but you may not get that instruction set advantage in it. Okay, but this tool, remediates against that. Yeah, so, and, and what we do, we're actually using VM tools itself okay. to, to go through and validate uh, you know, a lot of those components. So we'll look and make sure VM tools is enabled in the first place on, on the uh, source system. And then when it gets to the destination system, we also look at VM tools to see what is, what is and what is not enabled. So. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Yep. What's the zinger? Where doesn't it work? You, you already said cold, we understand. You can schedule for cold migrations. That's, so, that's, that's right. not a zinger. What's the zinger? Where doesn't it work? It doesn't work, like live migrations just don't work. No live, right? okay, okay, fine. No live. What about something else? What's the, what's the oh, you've got that version. You've got that version of x86 architecture. It yeah. won't work. Um, Anything? A majority of those cases work where it, it would fail, where it's going to kick back and say, hey, you know, it's VM tools is not installed. So where you would see this is like, if you're running a virtual, like a virtual appliance from some vendor, Okay. Um, you know, you know, you like insert vendor here that say got a firewall or got you know something like that, and they don't have VM tools enabled. It's going to fail it out of the gate and say, hey, VM tools is not on this. You might want to manually do it, right? But you so can figure out how to fix that. You can figure out how to do that. Well, you can also, and there is a flag in there. So in kind of the options that you give it, you say, eh, ignore VM tools, don't care, move it anyway. So if you've got you know less you know like some VMs that are in there, but they're they're you know not a priority VM, then then it's going to migrate just fine. Got Can it. you talk, elaborate a little bit on the joint development work that AMD and VMware are doing together and the value in it for customers? Yeah, I mean, so it's one of those things we, we um, uh, worked with uh, VMware uh, to basically produce this, this open source tool. So we did a lot of the core component and design and we actually engaged VMware professional services. You know, and a big shout out to Austin Browder. He, he helped us a ton in this, in this, in this project specifically. And, uh, and uh, we, we basically worked, we, we created this uh, kind of code design, uh, what it was going to look like, and then kind of jointly worked together on, on the coding, uh, you know, of, of pulling this thing together. And then, you know, after that, so, and this is actually posted up on, you know, VMware's public repos now uh, in GitHub. So you can go to GitHub, you can, you can go to the VMware samples code, and you can download uh, the, this uh, thing that we've created. And you know, it's really built to help uh, ease migrations you know, from one architecture to another. So if you're looking for a big data center move and you got a bunch of VMs to move, I mean, even if it's you know, like same architecture to same architecture, it's definitely going to ease that, you know, kind of the pain of, of going through and doing a migration of, you know, it's one thing when you're doing 10 machines, but when you're doing 10,000 virtual machines, that's a different story. It gets, it gets uh, to be quite uh, uh, operationally inefficient. <laughs> I lose track after three. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm good for three, not four. I was going to ask you who your, what your target market segment is here. Expand on that a little bit and talk to me about who you're working with in those organizations. Right, so um, really this is targeted toward organizations that are, have you know, large deployments in enterprise, but also I think this is a, a big play uh, uh, with channel partners as well. Uh, so folks out there in the channel that are doing these migrations, and, and they do a lot of these for when you're thinking about the small and mid-size organizations, it's a great fit for that, especially if they're you know, kind of doing that, that upgrade, the lift and shift upgrade from like, here's you've been five to seven years on an architecture and you want to move to a new architecture. This is really going to help. And the 
this is not a point and click GUI kind of thing, right? It's a, it's a you know, command line driven, it's using PowerShell, we're using PowerCLI uh, to do a uh, majority of this uh, work. And for channel partners, this, gives, this is an excellent opportunity to put the value in the value add of a VAR, right? And okay. there's, there's a lot of opportunity for, I think, channel partners to really uh, go and take this. And once again, being open source, we expect this to be extensible. We want the community to contribute and you know, kind of put back into this to basically help, help grow it and make it a more useful tool for doing you know, these cold migrations you know, between CPU architectures. So. Have you seen any in the last couple of years of dynamics, obviously, across the world? Any industries in particular that are really leading edge for what you guys are doing? Mm, that's a, yeah, that's a really, really interesting. I mean, we've seen it, it's honestly been a very horizontal problem. Um, pretty much across all vertical markets. I mean, we've seen it, you know, in, uh, you know, financial services, we've seen it in, um, you know, my, honestly, uh, you, you know, pretty much across the board. I mean, I think manufacturing, uh, manufacturing financial services, healthcare, um, we have seen, you know, kind of a, a strong interest in that. And then also we have, we've actually taken this and presented this to some of our channel partners as well. And there was a, there was a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of interest in, in it, um, I think we, we presented to about 30 different channel partners um, a couple of weeks back about this and I got contact from 30 different channel partners that said they're interested in, in basically helping us work on it, so. You know, tagging on to Lisa's question, do you have visibility into kind of the AMD thought process around the timing mm. of your yeah. next gen release right. versus others that are competitors in the marketplace, right. how you might leverage that uh, in terms of uh, programs where partners are going out and saying, hey, perfect time, you need a refresh, perfect time to look at AMD yeah. if you haven't looked at them right. recently. Um, do you have any insight into that and what, what's well, going on? I know you're, I mean, you're, you're, you're focused on this area, yeah. but what, what, are your, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I what's mean, the buzz? What's, yeah, the, yeah. What's, what's the buzz inside AMD on that? Well, when, when you look overall, when, uh, I mean, if you look at like the Gartner hype cycle, when VMware was being broadly adopted, right? When VMware was being broadly adopted, I'm going to be blunt and I'm going to be honest right here. AMD didn't have a, a horse in the race, right? And uh, the uh, uh, majority of those VMware deployments we see, you know, are not, you know, running on AMD. Now that said, there's an extreme interest in the fact that we've got, you know, these, these very core dense systems that are now coming up on what you know you're at that five to seven year refresh window of of you know pulling in new hardware and we have extremely attractive hardware when it comes to running you know virtualized workloads test cluster that i'm running uh, at home i've got that five to seven year old gear and i've got some of the you know even just the milan systems uh, that we've got and I've got you know three nodes uh, of another architecture going onto AMD and when I got that system, these three nodes completely maxed to the number of VMs that I can run on them, I'm at a quarter of the capacity of what I'm putting on the new stuff. So what you get is, I mean, it's we've worked the numbers and it's, it's definitely, it's like a, a 30%, you know, like, decrease in the amount of resources that you need. Which is, that's a compelling number. It's a compelling 5%, number. 5%, 10%, nobody's going to do anything for yeah. that. You yeah. talk 30%. 30%. It's meaningful, yeah. it's meaningful. Now you, you, you're you out of Austin, right? Yes. So first thing I thought of when you talk about running clusters in your in your home is <laughs> the cost of electricity, but you're okay. I'm you okay. <laughs> you don't live here, you don't live okay. here, you don't need to worry about that. I'm okay. Do you have a favorite customer example that you think really articulates the value of AMD when you're in customer conversations and they go, why AMD? And you hit back with this. Yeah, um, actually it's funny because I had a conversation like that last night. You know, random, um, you know, kind of, kind of random person I, I, I met later on in the evening. We were going through this discussion and they had, they were facing exactly this problem. They had that five to seven year infrastructure um, it's funny because the guy was like a gamer too, and he's like, "Man, I've always been a big AMD fan. I love, I love CPUs. I've, you know, all the way since you know, you know, back in basically the the Opterons and and Athlons, right? He's like, I've always loved the, the AMD systems. Love, love the graphics cards. And he, now with the, you know what we're doing with Ryzen and all that stuff, he's I've always been a big AMD fan. He's like, and I'm going through doing my infrastructure refresh, and I I told him I'm just like, well, you know, hey, pop the uh, talk to your talk to your VAR. And, and you know, have them plug some AMD SKUs in there from, from the Dell's, HP's, and Lenovo's, and 
then we've got this tool to basically help make that migration, you know, easier on you. And uh, so, you know, once we, uh, we, we had that discussion and it was great. He, then he swung by the booth today and I was able to, you know, kind of just go over like, hey, this is the tool, this is how you use it. Hey, like, here's all the info, call me if you need any help, right? So. Yeah, we, you know, when we were talking earlier, um, we learned that you were at scale. Yes. So what do you, what do you, what do you like it about AMD? How does, how does, how does that relate? The funny yeah. thing is, this is like actually the uh, first time in my career that I've actually had a job where I didn't work for myself. Uh, I've been doing, I've been, I've been doing venture back startups the last 25 years, and we've raised like you know a couple hundred million dollars worth of worth of investment over the years. And uh, so one, I figured like here I am going to AMD, a larger corporation. I'm just like, am I going to be able to make it, you know, a year, right? <laughs> and I have been here longer than a year and I absolutely love it. The culture at AMD is amazing. We still have that really, I mean, almost it's like that, that underdog mentality within the, within the organization. And um, the team that I'm working with is a phenomenal team and it's actually, uh, you know, our, uh, our, uh, the kind of, our EVP and our corp VP um, were actually my uh, executive sponsors. They were at a prior company. Um, they, were, they were one of my executive sponsors when I was at scale. And so, you know, my, uh, my now uh, uh, VP uh, boss uh, calls me up and says, hey, I'm putting a band together. Are you interested? And I was like, I was kind of enjoying a semi-retirement, you know, lifestyle, and then I'm just like, man, because it's you, yes, I am interested. And, you know, the group that we're in, the, the work that we're doing, um, the way that we're, you know, really focusing on forward-looking things that are affecting the data center, what's going to be in the data center like three to five years from now, it's exciting, right? And I am having a blast. I'm having the time of my life. I absolutely love it. Well, that relationship and the trust that you will have with each other, that bleeds into the customer conversations, the partner conversations, the employee does. conversations. It's all inextricably mm -hmm. linked. Yes, it is. And we want to know, you said three to five years out. <laughs> like what? <laughs> like what? what do you think? I mean, yeah. just general futurist stuff. Where do, you th where, do you think this is, where do you think this is going? Well, that's interesting. So, so, so moon collides with the earth in 2025. We already know that. So, 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 so we dial this back to kind of that the, the Pensando acquisition. When you look at the Pensando acquisition, that's and you look at basically where data centers are today, but then you look at where basically the big hyperscalers are, right? You look at an AWS, you look at their architecture, you specifically wrap Nitro around that. That's a very different architecture than what's being run in the data center. And when you look at what Pensando does. That's a lot of starting to bring what these real clouds out there, what these big hyperscalers are running into the grasp of the data center. And so I think you're going to be, see a fundamental shift. The next 10 years are going to be exciting because the way you look at a data center now, when you think of what CPUs do, what shared storage, what's, you know, how the networking is all set up, it ain't going to look the same. Okay, the, so the competing vision with that to play devil's advocate would be DPUs are kind of expensive. Why don't we just use NICs, give them some more bandwidth, <laughs> and use the cheapest stuff? Is, would you, is that is it, that's the competing vision? That that could be. Or the the alternative vision. vision. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 I imagine like everything else we've experienced in our careers, they will run in parallel paths, fit for function. It, it, what do you think? Well, parallel paths always exist, right? Yeah. You know, other, otherwise, because you know how many times you've heard mainframes dead, tapes dead. Right. Spinning disk is dead, right. none of them are dead, dead yeah. right? The, the reality is you get to a point uh, within an industry where you know, it, it, it basically goes from, instead of a growth curve like that, you know, it goes to a growth curve of like that, right? It's pretty right. flat, right? So from a revenue growth perspective, I don't see, think you're going to see the revenue growth there. I think you're going to see the revenue growth in DPUs. And when you actually take, they may be expensive you know, now, um, but you look at what Monterey's doing and you look at the way that you know, kind of those DPUs are getting integrated in uh, at the OEM level, it's going to be a part of it. You're going to, you know, you're going to order your, you know, like VX rail, uh, you know, and VSAN style uh, boxes. They're, they're going to come with them, right? It's it's going to be an integrated component because when you start to offload things off the CPU, you've dri driven your overall utilization up, right? When you don't have to process like NSX on basically the x86, you've just freed up cores and a considerable amount of them, right? And you've also moved that to where there's a more intelligent place for that pack to be processed, right? Out here on this edge, because you know what? 
that might not need to go into the host bus at all. So you have like just alleviated any any transfers like over a PCI bus, over the PCI lanes into DRAM, you know, all of these components when you're like, but that was all all to come with like, oh, that that, that bit needs to be on this other machine, right? So now it's coming in and it's making that decision there. And then you take and integrate that into like things with like the, the Aruba smart switch that's running the Pensando technology. So now you got top of rack that is already making those intelligent routing decisions on where packets really need to go. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. I know you guys could keep talking. No, I was going to say, you're going to have to come back. <laughs> you're going to have to come back. We've just started to peel the layers of the onion, but we really appreciate you coming by the show, talking about what AMD and, and VMware are doing, what you're enabling customers to achieve. Sounds like there's a lot of tailwind behind you. That's awesome. Yeah. Great stuff, thank it's you. A, it's a great time to be at AMD, I can tell you that. Ah, that's good to hear, we like it. Well, thank you again for joining us, we appreciate it. For our guest and Dave Nicholson, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE live from San Francisco VMware Explorer 2022. We'll be back with our next guest in just a minute.